Good morning. Good morning. I'm Paul Marion, President of Tiffany University. I'm pleased to welcome you to the last Good Morning World uh, uh, lecture of this academic year. Uh, Good Morning World is a community service that Tiffany University has provided for many years and we're pleased to have all of you here. I think today will be one of our more interesting programs, at least in the 12 years I've been here. And to introduce our speakers, I'd like to uh, ask Ron Schumacher, our Vice President for Development and Public Affairs, to come to the podium. Thanks, Dr. Marion, and uh, good morning, Tiffin, and welcome to Good Morning World. Um, a couple thank yous before I uh, bring these uh, two gentlemen up. Um, this is the 30th year that Tiffin University has been doing Good Morning World, so uh, a, a big thank you to Dr. Marion for allowing this program to continue. I think the uh, quality of speakers uh, over the years has been incredible and the impact hopefully on the students um, has uh, has greatly enhanced their education at, at Tiffin University. Um, today I also have to thank Dr. Steve Hurwitz for uh, his assist, his work in securing these two gentlemen to come in here today and basically spend uh, part of the night last night and much of the day today into the evening to talk about the Innocence Project and to talk about the folks that um, were incorrectly incarcerated um, and in Dean's case over 20 years and I, I think when Dean gets up here and starts talking uh, you'll be as moved as we were last night in, in hearing uh, his story so on with the show in the past 25 years more than 1200 inmates have proven innocent and released from prison after serving time, sometimes decades, for crimes they did not commit. The Ohio Innocence Project has been one of the leaders in this movement. To date, the Ohio Innocence Project has obtained the release of 17 innocent Ohio inmates who together served nearly 300 years in prison. Mark Godsey serves on the board of the Innocence Network and has been a leader in helping the innocence movement expand around the globe. A former federal prosecutor, Mark is considered a leading scholar, lawyer, and activist, activist on the subject of wrongful convictions. He is the editor of the Wrongful Convictions blog and is a frequent commentator on the subject in the national press. Uh, Mark is a tenured faculty member at the University of Cincinnati, and I'll let him get into his background a bit more. Eyewitnesses linked Dean Gillespie to the rape of three women in Dayton in 1988. He was convicted despite his claims that he was camping in Kentucky at the time of the crimes. A federal judge overturned his conviction in December 2011 based on the fact that prosecutors withheld information from the jury about the original investigation. Police investigators concluded that Gillespie did not fit the victim's description. He also had an alibi and there was no physical evidence. U.S. Judge Michael Mers recognized evidence that someone else had committed the rapes and that police had engaged in misconduct, which is deliberately hiding or destroying evidence. Please welcome with me and with Tiffin University today, Mark and Dean, as they present wrongful conviction, getting the innocent out of prison. Mark, Dean. Thank you everyone for coming out to uh, hear Dean's story today. I'm gonna start off talking a little bit just generally about the innocence movement and then I'll bring Dean up and introduce his case and uh, have him talk a little bit and answer questions. So um, I was, uh, as he mentioned, a federal prosecutor in New York City. I'm originally from Cincinnati and um, at a certain point in time once I had kids we sort of wanted to move back home and there are two law schools in Cincinnati. There's University of Cincinnati where I now work and there's uh, Northern Kentucky which is right across the river. 
And the year we moved, um, UC didn't have an opening, but Northern Kentucky did, and so I took the job there as a criminal law professor. And they had a, an innocence project already in existence. And the guy who ran it, the professor who ran it, was on sabbatical that year. So the dean said to me, um, you know, you're the new criminal law guy, you're gonna have to fill in. And I came to it from a very prosecutorial mindset. In one of the very first meetings, the students were talking about a guy named Herman May that they had just gone to visit in prison. And they were just so emotionally moved by his story and his claims of innocence. And I remember them saying, you know, I looked into his eyes and I could just see the, the pain and there's no way unless he's an Oscar winning actor that this was real. Um, I mean, that this wasn't real. And I remember, as I said last night, I was sitting there thinking, this is the biggest bunch of I have ever seen. And um, uh, within a few weeks, uh, DNA testing came back and proved him innocent. And he had been a high school student who was sitting in his social studies class when the police came in and grabbed him, dragged him down to the station and plucked pubic hairs from him to match the pubic hairs from the crime scene, which uh, a so-called expert later said matched. DNA testing proved they didn't match many years later after he spent 12 years in prison for a crime he didn't commit. Um, so that was sort of a shock to me coming at it from a prosecutorial standpoint. And because I, I had to be responsible for this organization for a year, I, I went to the conference that was in New Orleans that year where I met people from all around the country who had been wrongfully convicted. And I met lawyers who were doing this work. And it just really opened my eyes and, and blew my mind, actually. Um, so the next year, a, a criminal law spot came open at UC, and I moved across the river. And at that point, 2003, Ohio was the largest state that didn't have an Innocence Project. So I started the Innocence Project here. Um, we've been in existence now over 10 years, and as he said, we've gotten 17 people out of prison who all together served nearly 300 years in prison for crimes they didn't commit. But I'm going I'm to back up a little bit about the movement generally. You know, the way our system worked, and unfortunately still it works uh, to some degree, is that we believe we don't make mistakes. You know, we have all these constitutional rights and uh, presumption of innocence, and people aren't convicted unless there's proof beyond a reasonable doubt. So you go back and you look at opinions where inmates wrote to judges and said, I'm innocent from the 1950s, 1960s, 70s, 80s, and the judges would deal with these petitions by saying, you know, you're guilty, you were convicted, we've got the best system in the world, we don't make mistakes, shut up. Then along, along about 1992, something came along called DNA testing, which really turned everything on its head um, because it allowed us to go back and look at some of these cases where people were claiming innocent and use new technology to find out once and for all whether they really were. And it started in New York with a guy named Barry Sheck. You may remember him from the O.J. Simpson Dream Team. He was the DNA specialist. He's the one that first had this idea and started testing cases. And he and his students at Cardoza Law School, within just a few years, by, by the mid-1990s, had exonerated 75 people around the United States. And I think 19 of those first 75 were on death row at the time they were exonerated. This got more and more attention through the 90s, so Innocence Projects started sprouting up at different schools. Now there's over 60 in the United States, and they're spreading, and they're in every continent at this point. And um, together, the Innocence Projects have freed over 1,200 people on grounds of innocence. The um, Stanford and Michigan law schools operate a website called the National Registry of Exonerations, which you can go to, that outlines every case where the person's been proven innocent through this innocence movement. And there's new individuals being added weekly. I think there was two more this week. Um, and you can see all the documents behind it, and what went wrong in the cases, and all that kind of stuff. So um, Justice Scalia of the US Supreme Court gave a speech a few years ago where he looked at that number. I think at that point, it was like 900 people had been proven innocent. And he said, you know what? There's been hundreds of thousands of people in the United States since this innocence movement, the last two decades, who have been convicted, but there's only been about 900 proven innocent. And he did the math and he said, you know, that's .00001%. So that means we get it right 99.99999% of the time. And I just want to make the point that I, I can't tell you how many people in prison are innocent or what the percentage is, but I know that that's a misleading number. And I'll give you a quick illustration to show how I know that. So tens of thousands of people have written to one of these innocence projects um, claiming innocence. And the first thing the students do when they get one of these petitions is they pull up the appellate decisions, they pull up the newspaper articles, they dive into the documents of the case to figure out if it's a type of case where DNA could prove innocence or guilt. And the vast majority of the time, there's nothing that DNA can do in the case. You know, so if somebody shot me right now through that window and jumped in a getaway car, uh, there's no DNA at the crime scene, right? There's nothing that could be tested. And about 95% of, of cases that occur, there's nothing that DNA can do either way. 
So the students look into it and they, they say, well, this guy's just out of luck. We don't know if he's innocent or guilty. There's nothing we can test. And then the next step becomes, okay, well, if this is one of the lucky 5% where there could be DNA, we've got to find it and see if it still exists. Some of these cases are 15, 20, 30 years old. In fact, of our 17 clients, the one who served the most time spent 30 years in prison for a crime he didn't commit. So you're going back and you're trying to find uh, fingernail scrapings or uh, a rape kit with semen in it that's been sitting on a, allegedly sitting on a police shelf for 30 years. And about 75% of the time, the students can't find it. It's been lost, it's been destroyed, it's been lost in the shuffle. So if these are all the people claiming innocence, right, the innocence projects, about 95% of them get cut pretty much right off the bat because their um, case doesn't involve DNA. And then the, the lucky 5% here, about 75% of those end up getting cut because after a year-long search, we can't find the DNA. So you have all the people freed coming out of a little sliver, okay? Now, of the individuals who are lucky enough in their case to have actually have DNA that can, can be found and can be tested, about 50% of the time the DNA testing comes back and confirms the person's guilty. And we've had that happen in a number of our cases and we always tell the students that's the best result you could possibly ask for. You know, we're not invested in the process, we just want justice. And if the guy did it, um, that's a great result because that shows the bad guy hasn't been on the street committing more crimes, the victim didn't make a mistake, everything else. About 25% of the time, the, um, the DNA testing comes back inconclusive. So the lab says, you know what, this has been sitting in a shelf for 20 years, it's been too moist, that kind of thing, we can't get a result. But about 25% of those cases, the DNA testing comes back and proves the guy innocent. So it's important to recognize that it's a little sliver here that goes to testing, and 25% of those are innocent. And there's no difference between the 25% in this little sliver and everybody else out here. There's just, there, these people just aren't lucky enough to have DNA testing in their cases. It's not like these cases are stronger, so these people have a higher percentage of being guilty. All right, they just don't have DNA in their cases. Um, so does that mean that I'm suggesting 25% of people in prison are innocent? Absolutely not. The sample we're dealing with are people who have actually written to an innocence project, right, which is a small subset of the overall prison population. But just basic math tells you that the number of people we've discovered who are innocent is a very, very small sliver of the number who are sitting in prison. And some of these people out here sitting in prison without DNA in their cases are sitting on death row in whatever state, Oklahoma, Texas, Ohio, or whatever else. Um, so again, I, I don't know the extent of the problem, but I know it's much more serious than, um, Ms. than Justice Scalia has indicated. Um, Dean is one of the few cases that we've taken where there's no DNA in the case. And we started off in his case as a DNA case um, because the, one of the women had, had um, semen from the perpetrator on her clothing. And so we tried to track that down and it turns out the police had thrown it away. He was in that percentage where the um, cops had, had tossed it after his conviction. But it was a rare situation because in the amount of time we were working on the case, we had very, very serious concerns that this was a wrongful conviction. And so we dug in and continued to investigate despite the fact that there was no DNA. I'm gonna, this case is very complicated. I'm gonna talk about it briefly and then uh, bring him up to, to have him talk. But um, essentially it was three rapes in a row that occurred in Dayton all in a very short period of time. And it was clearly done by the same man. It was the same MO. Um, he would pretend like he was a police officer, flash a badge in a public place like the Dayton Mall parking lot, um, get the women into a car, say that he's arresting them because he saw them shoplifting inside, take them out in the woods, and then he would have them perform oral sex on him. So it was a very specific type. He would not take off their clothing. He would not take off his clothing. He would have them perform oral sex on him. And um, he would say these very specific things to the women, like, uh, I'm from Corpus Christi, Texas. I, I do this because I was molested by my grandfather when I was 12. I'm a contract killer for the CIA. I get paid $1,000 per hit. You know, he was real talkative as he was driving in the car with them and things like that. Um, the, the, the crime went unsolved for over two years, completely cold case. They had wanted posters from the, the women's description of the guy <clears throat> with a composite sketch they put all around town. Dean was 25 years old, had a great union paying job at GM, no criminal record whatsoever. <clears throat> but he had had, um, very serious run-ins with uh, a co-worker, a supervisor at work, and there was a great deal of uh, acrimony, uh, I would have to say. Um, the co-worker took his GM picture over to the police station and said, I think this guy looks like the composite sketch, with no other basis to think that D Dean did it than that. And um, 
the detectives could see the vendetta in this guy and his voice and everything he was saying about Dean. They could see it didn't match at all. Uh, but they did an investigation and they conclusively uh, eliminated Dean as a suspect. And one of the things that caused them to eliminate him is that there was a report that one of the women had seen the pant size of the guy who did it because he dropped his pants and the little tag inside. And they looked up Dean's uh, height and weight in the DMV and there's no way he could have fit into those pants. So it's sort of like if the, if the glove doesn't fit, you must have quit, but the jeans don't fit. I mean, there's no way these jeans would have fit him. <laughs> so um, none of this was known though, okay? Because what happened is uh, those two experienced detectives retired. One went to Arizona, one went to Florida. And then a new detective took over the case, his first major case, he was 26 years old, who happened to be good friends with Dean's supervisor. The Dean supervisor had known this 26-year-old this since he was a young boy and uh, had grown up as, uh, had been friends with this boy's father and had known him since he was little. The uh, GM employee took the photograph back over again to his now buddy and um, gave it to him and said, start up this investigation. Within just a short period of time, he got all three victims to identify Dean with an extremely misleading photo spread. I could talk forever about how those identifications occurred. Um, that was the only evidence in the case. What happened next, though, is what wasn't discovered until 15, 20 years later. The file was sanitized and destroyed. So that earlier investigation of Dean, including the stuff about the pant size, all of that was erased from the file. So when it was presented to Dean, when he found out about it, all he knew was the second time. He thought that was the first time. They didn't know any of those facts from the original investigation. Everything that, that um, contradicted Dean was taken out of the file. And um, they brought charges against him. So we were able to find that through investigation. We talked to the detectives down in, uh, in Florida and Arizona um, who confirmed what had happened. And they actually came and testified in federal court, causing the federal court judge to find a gross police misconduct and throughout his conviction. Separately, um, an individual continued committing crimes like this with the same MO, posing as a police officer, abducting women in, in, in locations and taking them off. And um, so uh, an anonymous tip came in that the individual who committed these crimes his name was Kevin Cobb. So we spent several years investigating this guy named Kevin Cobb, and we had a long string of domestic violence arrests from various girlfriends in the past. So we went out and started interviewing, tracking these women down. And what did we find? Well, he would tell me uh, after we have sex sometimes that uh, he was molested by his grandfather when he was 12, and it still shakes him up. What else did we find? He only wants oral sex. I'd have to beg him to have regular intercourse, and he, he wouldn't be able to perform. Um, he would tell people that he's from Corpus Christi, Texas. Um, he would brag to people that he was a contract killer for the CIA and got $1,000 per hit. Just a whole string of things that perfectly matched exactly what the perpetrator did in this case. So in a completely separate lawsuit in state court, the other one, the police misconduct is a federal issue, that was in federal court. But in the state proceedings, we presented all this evidence that Kevin Cobb was the one who committed these crimes and um, presented all the witnesses that knew Kevin Cobb and the things he'd said in the past. And we got a state court to agree that Kevin Cobb was clearly the one who had committed these crimes. And so the state court overturned Dean's conviction on a completely separate ground. I wish I'd brought the composite sketch because we took the, the sketch that the women had made of the perpetrator's face. And we took a picture of Kevin Cobb from 1988 and we split him in half and merged the faces together. And it is like one face. Usually composite sketches aren't that good. Uh, but they nailed this one. I mean, it was like you couldn't even tell which one was real and which one was the composite sketch. It was really amazing. So Dean was released about uh, two years and two months ago, three months ago. And uh, Dean, why don't you come up and, and we'll start off by, um, if you could put up the, the painting with the, uh, with the toilet. I want to have a seat here. Dean uh, has uh, some injuries from um, prison that without that adequate medical tension, he can't really stand for very long. Uh, but why don't you describe um, this painting to them and what you were thinking. This was one that he did in prison. Here you go. Uh, first thing I'd like to ask Mark is, he tells his story about the pants size all the time. Was I too fat to fit in them pants? <laughs> yes, you were. <laughs> uh, this, uh, this painting I did here is um, in 2010, UC uh, hosted the National Innocence Conference and they asked the guys who were in the program if they would do some artwork, do a poem, do a story, do something that means something to them about their time in prison. And uh, they actually done a book, uh, The Illustrated Truth, 
that you can, uh, I think you can order it online, can't you? Yeah, Amazon. Beautiful book. It's got a lot of guys' stories in it, a little bio on them, and then their artwork and uh, the story behind the artwork. But this is my piece that I uh, put in for the project. And um, <clears throat> February 12th, 1991, I was sent to prison for something I didn't do. I was kidnapped by the state of Ohio. Up in the uh, top corner there is my interpretation of, of what I looked like in uh, 91 there. Um, <clears throat> I got a metal plate across my face because I'm screaming and hollering telling people I didn't do this. I did not do this. And uh, on that plate it says, no one's listening. The toilet, I just found out last night that American Standard's up here. <laughs> and it's an American Standard toilet because this type of thing has turned into an American Standard. It, the prosecutor wants a conviction. He doesn't care who it is. Get him in there so we can clear this up. Um, it was just a coincidence that, that I found that out last night. The toilet to me is my representation of a sacred pot. It's, it's what is inside that filthy, nasty toilet is what is important to my life at that time, what meant something to me. And if you look in the bottom of it, in P yellow, you'll see life, which is just my life in the bottom of it. And it goes around in a circle of things that I lost, missed, um, you know, starting out with, you know, the, I lost my business, my home, um, running around with my buddies, fishing, skiing, camping, we did it all. <clears throat> but as you go around, over time, you know, my buddies got married, they had kids. So I got their wife and, and their name down there and then their kids and it just keeps going around uh, until it's, you know, everything that, I, that I'm losing over this time in prison. Down in the bottom corner is, we were having a hearing coming up and it was um, July 10th of 2010. And I changed the, the clicker to an odometer because time just keeps going over and just keeps going and going. And what you get is the prosecutor will throw this crap out of, you know, motion denied, 90-day extension, which you hear a lot of 90-day extension. Um, I heard 20 years of 90-day extension. Uh, appeals denied, all that. His, his rhetoric and crap couldn't get inside this toilet because it, it was just crap to me and it wasn't going to get in that pot. And uh, that's why it's scattered all over the floor and everywhere else, but it's not in that nasty toilet. But down in the bottom is, is my representation of me. I painted that off the ID that we have to wear in there. And I still got the plate on my face and still no one's listening. And um, on the back side of this painting, it has, everything's in a different color, so you can color code it and see what each thing represents and what it means and why it's on there. I wish we had a picture of the back side. I think it's could, in there, isn't it? You could read that. Um, <clears throat> But at the time, uh, to have this Innocence Project come on board is just, it's, it's unbelievable. Yeah, and why don't you uh, go to the next painting, that one with the Indian. Okay. I did this painting here. Um, I give this to uh, Mr. Petro. Jim Petro was the uh, Attorney General. He, uh, he did a case with Mark, Clarence Elkins' case. Uh, out of uh, was Summit. Mm -hmm. um, Petro seen the uh, what was going on with the prosecutor up there. He would not let this thing go. Uh, Clarence found his wife and him found out that the guy who actually committed the crime he was in prison for was in the same prison he was in the same building in the same block, and uh, they got a cigarette butt. He sent it out. Mark and him tested it found that he was actually the guy who committed the murder. And uh, Mr. Petro got on board with that while he was the Attorney General and helped Mark with that. And seeing that, you know, this could be a big problem in, the, in the, uh, Ohio here, he didn't know it was going on. He left office, came on board with Mark to work on my case pro bono with Mark. You get the Innocence Project to work on your case, it's like hitting the lottery. You get the ex-attorney general on there and it's like the lottery Christmas and everything else. Hanukkah and all wrapped up into one. <laughs> and, uh, he came on board, a huge amount of media came with it and um, 
what I interpreted as was Petro was the top law official in Ohio. And um, so he was a cowboy. And he's seen that this is going on. This is something I need to get into and get involved with, and he has greatly. And I've seen that he's like, he was riding the fence now of, well, I see this over here happening, but this is not the way I was trained. And this is my interpretation of an Indian who sees the cowboys are coming and it's, well, they're not so bad, and let me see what's going on. It's just a, a it's like he's in transition. He's, he's part one thing and he's part another thing. Uh, his, him and his wife wrote a book, False Justice, with my case, Clarence case, and another guy out of Cleveland's case with uh, uh, a huge amount of information on eight myths, why this happens in America. Um, it's got a lot of information on the Innocence Project and about Mark and the, and the program. But those are just the reasons I've done these paintings here. I've done a lot of paintings. It's, it, it, um, it clears your mind. I would put a CD on and just sit and paint all night long because you, you just get rid of every, all the crap that's around you. And uh, I would just get in that zone. And I mean, I'd sit and talk to these people when I was painting them, you know, in my mind. We'd listen to music, talking to these guys. And, um, it just kept me saying the artwork did. And, uh, you know, my buddies come over and stuff, and, and they'll look at it and everything. And I just, I tell them all the time, you know, they'll say, won't you sell me one of them paintings? Won't you sell me one of them paintings? I said, man, you got a wife, you got kids, you got your houses, you got your great jobs. This art is all I got. This is the only thing to show what I've done the last 20 years. And um, I've donated a few. I, I give some away, but it's, it, it, it just is, um, it's, it's what got me through that. And that's, I'll probably never do it again because I don't have the time no more. But uh, it, it was a nice therapy for me. Dean will answer any questions. I will answer anything you have a question, it doesn't matter what it is, I will answer it. Um, so, what did the state do to compensate you for the time serve all that? <laughs> Every time I speak, that's about the first question. Um, and like I told this gentleman last night, it, I come out there, I cut your leg off, throw it out in the pond out here, and say, well, I'm going to give you a couple thousand dollars for that. You know, no way, I want my leg back. I can't get it back, I can't get my life back. Um, you just got to throw it out of your head and, and uh, Go, but right now I'm on bond. I'm still on bond. I've been out two years, almost two and a half years. A federal court threw the case out. State court threw the case out. I got a prosecutor down there who won't let it go, and uh, I got to go down and pee in a cup every month, or if I go out of state or anything like that. So actually, uh, nothing has been. Prosecutor still appealing, appealing our wins. Yeah. So it drags it on for another couple of years. Wow. We did file a suit. Um, <laughs> In December, but it's that's a, we got to get this done first, uh, which you know it's going to take a couple years. Me personally, the money will never ever amount to nothing. You know, I lost 20 years. My parents, my brothers and sisters, you know, my friends, they couldn't bring a truckload of money in my house every day to to pay for that. There's no way. Dean, what was the rift? with the supervisor that drove him to to do what right. he did? Right. I, um, I got out of high school. My dad worked for General Motors too. He knew a lot of union guys, knew a lot of people at General Motors. I walked out of high school, went to General Motors for three months for an intern program. After that was done, two months later they called me, give me a job. 1985 I'm making fourteen dollars fifty cents an hour right out of high school. Um, I, I went to school in fire science technology because basically what it was is plant protection. So I was a fireman at General Motors, and um, these people had friends that they wanted to get the job, and I got the job. That started it off. That started the problem. So there was already animosity. Then here I am, fresh out of high school got one of the best jobs in America, and these guys are as old as my dad, trying to tell me how to do this and how to do that, and it's, you know, the old guy, old way, the new guy, new way, and that's just what started it all up, and it just kept escalating because I was, I was a smart aleck, there's no doubt about that, and, and that didn't help me none, you know. 
I could have chose a better way to present myself, you know, to, to, to show my ideas and my ways of doing things. So that's what just kept growing from that. Yeah. About the supervisor, <clears throat> whatever happened to him? Did he repercussions? <laughs> he retired from General Motors and gets a nice pension. There you go. Yeah, he, uh, my mom keeps track of them. She knows where all of them's at. Uh, he got some paperwork the other day that was, I'd like to have been there when he got it. Um, but yeah, he went on retired from General Motors. Uh, with a, he, he, he was uh, way up there. He was a high official with General Motors. He was actually in charge of five plants in Dayton. So he was huge in General Motors. Did the union get involved with it at all? Yeah, they got involved when they um, let me go because they were starting a police investigation. And uh, at that time, I was ready to leave. I, I grew up building houses. When I was 15, I started building houses with one of my dad's friends. I liked the outside. I liked working outside. I liked doing that stuff. And uh, I had a little company going. I was remodeling houses for two real estate companies in town. I was flipping houses myself at the time. So I had other things going on, too. And, um, you know, when it happened, I, you know, okay, and went on. Um, but the union just, you know, sit back and just, they didn't do a whole lot. So uh, I'm, a, I'm a, a fan of the union, but it didn't work for me at that time. So. Why don't you talk about what, uh, what you thought when you first started learning you were a suspect? Oh, I couldn't believe it. It, it. This case was two and a half years old when they came, when the police actually came to me and started questioning me. And I was like, well, what the heck are you talking about? I don't even know what you're talking about. Uh, the first thing they asked is, where were you at on this date two and a half years ago? I'm like, are you kidding me? I don't know where I was at last week. Um, so that was a you know problem, smart aleck mouth again, and uh, they kept calling, wanting to talk to me, calling, wanting to talk to me, and I'm like, if you're not going to tell me what's going on, I'm not coming down there. Um, and that didn't help me none either in the long run. They actually sent me a letter that I later found out was illegal, called an order in, and stupid me went down there and. Um, they started asking me all these questions I didn't have the answer to because it was two and a half years ago. I have no clue. Actually, when the trial started, I found out that I was in Kentucky with my friends on the day they had questioned there in uh, Moorhead. We used to go down to Cave Run Lake to fish, ski, and just, just have fun. And uh, that's how I found out where I was at. A friend of mine's dad had a calendar of, he raised coon hounds, and he had wrote down that uh, these pups were born on this day and we actually came back on that day and it was July we put the dogs down in the basement and stuff so he had a record of us being down there uh, we knew we had receipts because when you go down there you check in you get a receipt you put it on your window they keep a receipt there uh, this cop actually went down and took all the receipts that had our names on it so when you go down there, it was like we'd never been there ever and everyone in the whole town knew we were there because when we came into town, all of us had good jobs. We're driving new trucks into town. We got four-wheelers, boats, and everything else hooked up. We were like the big thing coming through town. It was like a circus when we came. So everyone knew we was there. We had people from the campground testify. We had people at the uh, marina that cooked for us every morning, you know, but no receipts were there. That was, the, you know, the first part of them destroying evidence and everything else that we later found out. <laughs> I'm not allowed to speak on that. <laughs> Let's just say I went to prison for 20 years. <laughs> and at the, uh, at the uh, final arguments, he, was, he had Fisher Price toys up there trying to explain the case. So it was, uh, yeah, he's helped, he's helped quite a bit here lately with uh, the things that are going on now. Um, he's helped quite a bit. Well, they so. thought about the day you, were, you finally were able to walk out. Yeah, that, that was uh, that was a <laughs> Shawshank Redemption. <laughs> um, it was uh, my sister was hit in from Nebraska. She lived in Nebraska. She came home. The the news a week ago, the federal judge threw the case out, and um, it was all over the news and everything. And, and uh, it's actually on YouTube. You can see when Mark called the prison to to let me know. Um, 
I'm like, when's it happening? When are they gonna let me out? He didn't know, he didn't have an answer to anything, but it was overturned. I was gonna be released at some point. So a week later, uh, my sister came to visit and uh, it was on the news that I was gonna be released. I was in the visiting room when this was all over the news. So I didn't know it was on the news. And uh, I come out of the visit and they're standing there waiting on me. I said, uh, you got to go with us, bless me. And I'm like, okay. I'm figuring I'm getting strip searched again, you know, thinking you're transporting something or whatever. When, when the white shirts are waiting on you from a visit, it's not good. So get out to the thing and they said, you're going to be released. Automatically, I need to change my pants because right. <laughs> I couldn't believe what they were saying. Um, so I got to go, I, I prepared for this. I talked to some of my buddies in there, you know, if this happens, I, I knew how it was going to go down. Once they come to get me, you know, you're going to have to go get your stuff. And when you're in prison, like these plastic cups, if you can find one of those, you're hanging on to it because it's all you got for, for utensils and stuff. So you got all this crap, you know, and people, you know, want this and that. Well, if you, if you get out like that, you got to take it all with you and they throw it all away. So. I told one of my cellies, I said, look, if this happens, get all this crap, just get it out. I'm walking out with my photo albums and my CDs, that's it. You guys can have the rest of it. So uh, when I got back to my cell, everything's gone. You know, I'm like, well, shit, they robbed me. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, well, you know, I'm going on. So um, I go down to the, uh, to the captain's office and I'm sitting there waiting. And I, I just literally could not believe what was getting ready to happen. I mean, I've sitting in prison for 20 years dreaming this was gonna happen. And I couldn't believe it, it just happened. My sister has the only vehicle my parents had at the prison. She's driving down the road, has no clue what's going on. And uh, my buddy's got a big, uh, one of those big limousine van things and picked my parents up and they all jumped on and came up to pick me up. I go out to front of the prison you know, they're asking my, my social security number and all this. I'm like, are you kidding me? When did I use it last? I don't, I don't know what it is. I have no clue. So they reminded me what it was and then I had to tell them what it was, which made no sense. I go through all the, you know, the gates slamming everything and there's this little bitty lady out there to pick me up and she's from the federal court. And I'm like, I'm getting ready to get shot. I, I think they're gonna kill me here. It's raining outside. It's 7.30. I knew if I got out, the media would be everywhere because Petro, um, there was nothing going on outside. And I thought, I'm not going out there. There's no way. I told them, I'm not going out there. This is not right. This is not, there's no way they sent this little bitty lady down here to let me out of prison to, to escort me home. And um, it scared me to death. She assured me she said, I'm the regional director for the federal government, for a U.S. Marshal. These people cannot do nothing to me. Um, and I'm like, well, I'm probably going to run to your car. Because, <laughs> I mean, it, scared, it literally scared me to death. And she said, you're safe, you're safe. Um, but I always remember the scene in Shawshank where they had the, the one kid, the young kid, and they went out and they said he was escaping and everything, and it just stuck in my head so bad. Got in the car, went down the road. Um, they had the, the uh, prison didn't want no one on the grounds. And as far as I know, everyone that Mark's ever let out, the, the, the whole, everyone's right there in the, in the front of the prison. And that was just strange to me. Go down the road, they, they let me out at a bowling alley of all places. The media's there, everyone's there. Um, I go in, my mom's there, we just start crying and everything. I actually uh, had to have an ankle monitor put on because I was on a house arrest for five months after I got out because the prosecutor wanted that on as, as um, he wanted something to, to make it like he was still in control. So the judge went ahead and let him do that. Um, so I'm in this bowling alley, the news is all in my face and everything and they said, well how does it feel to be out? And, you can see this on YouTube. I said, I didn't know I was out. It was league bowling night for the guards at the bowling <laughs> So, yeah, I was like, are you sure I'm out? <laughs> uh, yeah, but when I got home, uh, you get home and uh, 
going down the street, you know, that I grew up on, there's media trucks up one side, down the other. Everyone's parked on both sides of the road. I get off the, the bus and uh, there's people standing in the driveway I've known my entire life since I was a child and couldn't recognize them because I hadn't seen them. Their age over 20 years time. My buddies who came down to see me, I seen them every month. You know, I watched them age, you know, I, you, you don't notice it then. But I'm standing there looking at people like, uh, who are you? And it just, it uh, still, you know, I go out places and people come up to me and I don't know who they are. I try to act like I do, but um, I'm getting pretty good at that. <laughs> Actually, my buddies made a joke out of it. Uh, girls would come over to the house, you know, wanting to know what's going on and stuff. And, you know, well, how you doing? There's a lot of darlings and honeys and sweetie and all that. And I'd be like, who is it? Who is it? <laughs> you know? So uh, one girl came over and they decided that was just going to be, we ain't telling you, figure it out on your own. <laughs> Ended up being my girlfriend for uh, two years. Um, I got home three days that I was, the first three days I was out, 600 people came to my parents' house to visit in three days. My buddies were there day and night. Actually, two of my buddies were there. They had to go to work the next day. Five o'clock in the morning, they were arguing over who was going to be the last one out of the house. They decided they were both going out at the same time. An hour later, my other buddy went home, washed up, and said, I want to be the first one here today. <laughs> then he went to work. But I got lucky. Um, I grew up with a bunch of guys who I've known almost all my life. And uh, they stuck with me. They stuck with my parents. Um, they came and visit. They answered the phone. When you, when you got someone in prison, a phone call costs $6.50 when you pick it up for 15 minutes. Out-of-state call costs $20 for 15 minutes. The, the prison system is a gigantic money machine on people who are already strapped and it will bankrupt you in a second um, to try to just stay alive in prison because you get $18 a month for the work you do. Toothpaste, shampoo, soap, your 18 bucks is up. You go to that chow hall, you're starving to death day and night, you're hungry. And um, it, it's, a, it's a big economic strain on anyone who's got someone in prison. It's a huge economic strain. Um, but when I got out to the food thing, they kept asking me, you know, what do you want to eat? What do you want to eat when you get out? You missed all kind of stuff. What do you want to eat? And Godfather's Pizza had just came back around our area. And I said, you know, when the first Godfather's Pizza commercial came on, that they were back in town, almost ate the television. <laughs> I go in the house and they've got pizzas stacked up, 10, 15 Godfather's pizzas there. And I eat a lot of pizza the first three days. Um, one thing I, I, I haven't told a lot, but the first night I was there, I was home. I didn't sleep for three days. I was sitting in the, in the living room in my dad's chair and the, the lady next door to us has got a lot of problems. I'm sitting there, it's like 3 o'clock in the morning, all of a sudden I see red lights. I hit the floor. I'm crawling to the front window to see what's going on. Cop cars all up and down the street. I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to jump out the back window and get down the street. It absolutely terrified me, but she was having some health issues. I didn't know that it was going on at the time. That was terrifying because I thought, you know, oh my God, no way am I going back. There's no way. I'm not going through that again. No way. Um, but it ended up being nothing. What about technological changes, cell phones and computers and all that? Yeah, I, um, that, that's the hugest part of this. I, I tried to, with my buddies visiting and everything, I tried to keep up on, on you know, my mind and my mental stability and, and, and how I was going to be able to interact with everybody. But the technology change was just, it overwhelms you. When I went to prison, a friend of mine had a, one of those brick telephones the size of a suitcase. And, um, you know, I get out, I'm on the bus, they hand me a Blackberry that fits in the palm of your hand here and say, so-and-so is on the phone. So I'm talking like this, listening like this, talking like this. <laughs> Everyone on the bus is just laughing their butt off at me. You know, I thought it was just because I'm talking on the telephone. Keep talking like this, and finally they said, buddy, that's not a walkie-talkie. You can just hold it to your ear. So that 
and when I got locked up, people didn't have computers in their house. There was no, you know, IBM and um, GM, places like that had the computers. So no one had the computers. I, I heard all the time about the World Wide Web. Um, the, the technology that came with the computers is just, it, it's unbelievable to try to get caught up with that and try to figure it out. Because in prison, you have none of that. There's, there's nothing. It's just a archaic, barbaric place, and it's, it's, you're like you're in an Al-Qaeda cave all the time. Um, so the technology thing is, and I still, I probably will never get caught up to it because I fish too much to worry about it. Um, and I always said when I was in prison, I said, I'll never have one of them cell phones. It just actually, you know, you watch shows and stuff, it's like it aggravates you to death. I can't walk five minutes without looking at mine. So the, the, the technology thing was a big, big, it still is and it will be a long time. Um, is your physical impairment due to mistreatment while you're in prison? Uh, working for the prison, fell off a ladder, um, a pinched sciatic nerve. You know, we called it the veterinarian clinic. You go to the vet, and uh, here's some Tylenol. That uh, the medical health care in, in prison is it, it, it's no such thing. I watched a friend of mine pull five of his own teeth. That's how bad the medical care is. Now, you start pulling your own teeth, you're you're hurting. And it, you know, at first it was like, man, you're crazy. And then it's like, when are you pulling the next one? <laughs> you're always looking for entertainment in there. <laughs> But um, and, and reconciliation and seeing the people, well, do you see the people that had the vendetta against you around town? You said your mom? No, uh, being some under bond, I'm not allowed to be around them. I'm not allowed to talk to them and stuff. But on that note, the, the victims in this are as much a victim as I am with this. I have no animosity toward them whatsoever. They were tricked, duped into this whole thing just the way I was. I have no problem with my problems with the police officer, the prosecutor, the people who did this, you know, the people who knew better. What would you say to them if you could speak to them? I, I'm going to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can say that, you know, I feel bad for them because the person who did this is still out there, and that's a shame. You know, they were victimized, and the person who did it has not, has not been brought to justice. Yeah, I'm, I just, uh, I, it's, it's bad. It's bad for them and bad for me, too. You talked about seeing the red lights down the street and ducking down the floor. To how much are you still on edge? When you oh, uh, uh, yeah, all the time. You know, I, I got a couple friends that are police officers, and um, I, I don't trust the police. I don't, I absolutely can't stand a prison guard just because of the way they treat you in there. Um, I have a lot of problems when I do see one in public. I, you know, they they say I got PTSD, and uh, I, I I believe I know what it feels like when you when it overwhelms you because when I see one of those people, it's 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 all I can do to contain myself. It just it you just get so mad at the way they treat you and the and the uh, um, the way that they do things in there to maintain mental control over you and it, it just really aggravates you to see one. That's probably not a good thing for my mental health. Did you spend your entire time in Lebanon? No, I was at, uh, first when you go in, you go through CRC, uh, 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 Corrections Receiving Center, uh, in Orient. You go through there, the first two weeks you're there, they evaluate you mentally, they do all kind of tests of, of your aptitude and stuff like that. Um, you're pretty much walking around naked for a, a, at least a week, part of their humiliation thing for you and everything like that. Um, just the process that they go through. Then they send you to your parent institution, um, which would have been for me, uh, Warren, uh, in Lebanon. That's a close max. So you're going in there. Uh, the people in there have no hope. You know, most people in there are sentenced to life or, you know, 50 to life. My sentence was 23 to 56. Um, so it's, it's a lot of misery there. You, I spent 10 years there, got my security lowered to Lebanon. I went to, Le to I mean, sorry, to London, which is a medium minimum. Um, it's a little less violent, it's a little less uh, chaotic than, it's still chaotic, but not as much as a close max or maximum security. Uh, went to Madison, uh, several places, uh, 
they're all the same. They're miserable. Um, some are a little more bearable than others. Your close, your close max are absolutely miserable. The miserable place to be. He was talking about the guy who did 30 years. Ray Taller did 30 years on death row. There's, there's nothing worse on earth than death row in prison. You, you go nowhere. You, you're out of yourself for an hour. It's absolute misery. I, I don't know how you could do 30 years in there and be a, a, a normal person. How do you get your um, security reduced? Uh, just being, uh, you know, following rules. Your time is actually what controls what your level of security is, how much time you have left. Um, so I had, I did the 10 years at Lebanon, uh, at Warren pretty much incident free. Um, that helps a little bit, but my time had went down to see the parole board. And um, the closer you get to the parole board, they know that you're hanging on to hope that you know maybe the parole board will do something for you, which that's the biggest joke in Ohio. Um, but just, you know, just conduct, a lot of conduct in the amount of time you have in. Where do you see yourself in five years? Same place I am now, fishing. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess I was thinking, how do, you, how do you see things changing or maybe helping this situation you were in? Do you see yourself being able to help others? Oh, I, I, this speaking thing is the greatest thing for me. I wish we did it every week. I wish we could do it every week, but Mark's so busy. Um, just to get the word out, to, to, to let people know. We, you know, we talk at community events, we talk at uh, colleges, we talk all over, and and the thing is, to, if we talk to someone in this room that gets put on a jury, they've heard just a little bit. They they have checked out a little bit of this can go wrong. And the big part of my thing was when I was at trial, I had a guy on my on my um, jury who got mono, and he said that during the open arguments, my lawyer was talking and accidentally spit on him. He said, my lawyer gave it to him. And he tried to get off the case. This was, you know, several days into it. And they said, well, we're not going to let you off because you've been here too long and you've heard everything. And he said, well, he's guilty from here on out. That's what we want to prevent. You know, that should have been illegal right there. Um, but that's what we want to prevent is just to inform people that this happens. And I'll do this for the rest of my life. I'll do it for the rest of my life. This is. Uh, if, if one person knows the difference um, and takes the time to seek out the truth, it's, it's worth it. You say the prosecutor just won't let this go. Is there a possibility for you to be retried and reconvicted? I'll direct that to my lawyer. <laughs> yeah, um, they're, that's what they want to do. I mean, and that's unfortunately, um, most of these wrongful convictions uh, occur more from negligence or just human error than somebody intentionally doing something wrong. And in Dean's case, it's an exception. I, you know, this is the one case where I think we had a true bad actor in the system. Um, but most of my other cases, I don't think the prosecutors did anything wrong intentionally up front. They're just doing their jobs. The part that frustrates me is uh, the resistance we get. They don't want to admit the mistake was made. They're trying to protect their butts from lawsuits, all this kind of stuff. And so we get this extreme resistance uh, to, to doing the right thing and afterwards. And in their case, they um, are trying to retry him because after the judge throws out your conviction, the judge can't just say, uh, I'm exonerating him under an innocent statute and it's the end of it. That doesn't exist. All they can do is throw the con conviction out. And so in most instances, the prosecutor has the option if they want to, to try to retry the person. Um, and so that's what they wanted to do here despite all this evidence that the, we were gonna be able to put on. Um, and, uh, this, but the court stopped it. Um, and so they're appealing, um, trying to find out a way to do that, but it's, it's not going to be successful. I mean, it's going to take another year or two, then the case is going to be over with. Isn't that double jeopardy? No, if the defendant appeals or does something to overturn his conviction, it just goes right back to before. So if, if he were acquitted at the first trial, then they can't retry him. But that's why you'll see somebody get convicted in the news, and then the, the, the appellate court throws it out because there was some mistake at the original trial, then they do it again the second time because it was the defendant was the one that was asking for the second trial, so it's not double jeopardy. You, you can't imagine how much money, hundred, uh, thousands and thousands of dollars Mark spends to try to get a DNA test done that a prosecutor just doesn't want to do. 
Why wouldn't you want the truth? Seek the truth. That's what it should be. He has to fight these people so much to just get a DNA test done. It's insane. Why wouldn't they just agree to it and let's get the truth to the matter here. Let's get to it. It yeah. makes no sense. I'm going to tell a real quick story. We had a case a few years ago where typically what we do, somebody writes to us and they said, you know, I want DNA testing. There was a rape kit or there was this or was that. And, and we don't know if the guy's innocent or not. Our position is just he should have DNA testing to find out because many of these cases uh, where the person was proven innocent, there was overwhelming evidence of guilt. I mean, in one case out west, 11 different people identified the guy in broad daylight. DNA proved he was innocent. They all got on the stand and said, I'm sure, and they were all wrong. So, we, you know, we can never know. We always got to be open to the idea that we can make mistakes. So I will, I, I typically will approach the prosecutors and will say, this guy wants testing. Uh, we'll pay for the testing. So it doesn't cost anybody anything. And they'll say no. So in one case, um, we litigated it for several years, uh, wait, wasted tons of taxpayer money. All the courts and prosecutors have to spend all this time on it. It goes to the Court of Appeals eventually when they grant testing and send it back down. So then it goes forward with testing and it comes back confirming the guy's guilt. It just nails him. So um, normally at that point, you just do paperwork to dismiss it. It's over. But the prosecutor says, we want to do it in open court. We want to have an actual hearing where we dismiss your claim and the DNA testing. And we're like, okay, waste of time, but we'll come there. The reporter calls me the night before off the record and says, the actual elected prosecutor is coming tomorrow. Just giving you a heads up. And they're going to slam the Innocence Project for wasting all this time and all this taxpayer money for the last couple of years for somebody who was proven guilty. So I went back to my computer and I forwarded an email I'd sent to the prosecutor two years before. I said, I don't know what's going on tomorrow or why you're having a hearing, but I just want to let you know that uh, we offered to pay for testing two years ago. This would have been no cost to anybody. But we've wasted a couple years worth of taxpayer money um, fighting this just to prove a guy guilty, which we could have done two years ago. Um, then I get a call back from the reporter about 10 o'clock at night. Uh, the elected prosecutor is not coming. Um, <laughs> and they just send, you know, an underling there. And it takes two seconds. It gets dismissed. And it's the end. It's like, but that's the mentality. I mean, just fighting, fighting, fighting. No DNA testing. Um, that's not everyone. Like, for example, Ron O'Brien, the prosecutor in Columbus, is very reasonable um, that works with us on these sorts of things. He's just trying to get to the truth. But that's the part that's disappointing. Not that they're trying to do something wrong in the first instance. It's just human. It's what humans do, right? They get defensive. They don't want to admit mistakes. Um, so I guess in that way, it's not too surprising. Any movie deal? <laughs> <laughs> hey, um, I got a, a reporter who done a lot of stories on my case uh, early on, even before Mark came on. Uh, she wants to do a book, but I go to these national conventions and you know, you got 2,000 people that's got out of prison, 100 of them wrote a book and no one wants to publish a book no more because it's old news, it's, you know, it's like the story's worn out. So yeah, probably not. I think Conviction was a good movie, um, shows a lot of the plight and troubles that families go through for this. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, I'd say what's out there is out there. I wouldn't mind it, you know, I'd play my own part, I hope. <laughs> I should be worth 20 or 30 million dollars a movie. <laughs> How about we get any other questions? Mark, you related, you did, you told me last night about the fingerprint analysis. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot. One of the, when I have a lot more time, sometimes I'll go into the causes of wrongful conviction. And uh, you're interested in what I said last night about, you know, one of the problems is. Um, the public believes that the CSI stuff is real and um, that it's very reliable. But in reality, we're using a lot of sciences in court, so-called sciences that are completely unreliable or junk science. And um, there's been studies recently when they're examining these wrongful convictions. You know, this guy was proven innocent by DNA. How did a fingerprint expert get up on the stand and say his fingerprints were at the scene? How does that happen? Over and over again, you know, and things like that. So they start doing these, these studies. There's a guy in uh, Ireland, a professor, who is taking fingerprints and he goes and gets public record exhibits from a real trial where an expert had said, you know, here's a picture of the fingerprint from the crime scene. This was on the bloody knife. Here's the fingerprint of the defendant that was rolled at the police station. And I testify that this is a match. So he gets those and he goes to the, the expert who had testified in court six months earlier. Now these experts don't remember an, a fingerprint they looked at because all they do is look at fingerprints all day long. And he says, we're doing a study. Um, some of these people who had said that there was a fingerprint match, these experts, in cases where they were later proven innocent by DNA. Can you look at this and tell us where this expert went wrong? Now the expert doesn't, doesn't even know that this is fake setup. And this is a, one that he testified in court was a match six months or a year earlier. And in some of the studies, they can get the experts to flip 80% of the time, between 30 and 80% of the time, and come back and say, oh yeah, this is not a match. 
You can see a discrepancy up here that's not the same as this one. And then it's like, surprise, this is the setup. This is one you testified about in court six months before. And so what it's teaching us about psychology is that uh, we have such confirmation bias that if, the, if you're a fingerprint expert, you're not doing this on purpose, does the police come to you and say, this is a suspect, a bunch of witnesses have told us he did it. You're going to look at the fingerprints differently than if you're told at the beginning, this is a police officer that we want to exclude from the scene. Right. So we've got to make this, all of this stuff blind. We've got to make sure that when we're doing this, there's no biases being set that dictates the outcome. And him and Petro have done a good job getting Senate Bill 77 passed to help that happen with the blind photo lineups and the pres preservation of evidence and stuff like that. Mark and uh, Mr. Petro got enacted. And, and a lot of the states are looking at that as a model for their state on how they do investigations and preserve evidence and present evidence. Um, so Senate Bill 77, something to look up and read that he did. Uh, and uh, one of the other things is I have a friend who was uh, in prison for uh, shaken baby syndrome. And uh, she's going around now. The doctor who said that this happened, sick shaken baby syndrome, has seen that this is not the facts. It's not. There's other things involved, in the, and that's one of the things that's starting to go away it's slowly. Is the uh, shaken baby syndrome because of the, you know, the, what the innocence movement's done? It's the greatest thing in this world, as far as I'm concerned. Thank you all for coming out, and uh, I'll be here all day. Well, thanks to Mark and Dean. We uh, really appreciate your, uh, your words today. Uh, uh, my uh, faith in the criminal justice system should be strong and steady, right, uh, in certain cases. Um, I have to thank uh, the, the team in the development office, Sandy, Lori, John, Joe, Vicki, and uh, the, the team here at Camden Falls for putting this event on. Uh, for partnering with us. So thanks to all of them. So round of applause to, to them. Thanks to you for coming out today. Uh, really appreciate the community involvement, the students here, the faculty, the staff, and uh, we have now completed year 30 and we look forward to year 31 in the 2014-15 academic year. So thank you and have a great day.